Truly, truly, I tell you, unless the kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, in other words, unless it's planted, it remains alone. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. Now, he just didn't have a conversation about agriculture all of a sudden. He was talking about himself. If I don't die, I'm going to remain the only son God ever has. But if I fall to the ground and die, I'm going to be, as Paul said later, the firstborn of many brethren. And that was the goal. His sacrifice was going to make something possible that had never existed before. Jesus was the only son God had, but God wanted more. He, he, Jesus' death was going to bring about an experience that nobody had ever had. And that was the baptism of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of speaking in other tongues, the experience Jesus called born again. Here's the scene where that comes from. Jesus coined the term born again. John 3. This is early on in his life. There was a man of the Pharisees whose name was Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. He came to him by night and said to him, Rabbi, we know, us Pharisees, we really know this, you are a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that you are doing except God be with him. And Jesus answered and said to him, Oh, shucks, Nicodemus, thanks. <laughs> Jesus already knew he was a man sent from God. <laughs> he said, Truly, truly, I tell you, unless a man is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Now, in verses 4, 5, and 6, Nicodemus wonders if Jesus is teaching reincarnation. How can a man enter into his mother's womb again when he's old? I'm an old man. What do you mean born again? And Jesus said, don't marvel, don't be surprised that I told you, you must be born again. Whatever you do, don't miss out on that. People don't have to do things the way we do them here. This is just our custom. It's not eternal. We could set our chairs in triangles. We could turn every chair backwards and stare at the wall and have a good meeting. That's not the important thing. People don't have to be here, bodily present in this place. That's not required. They don't even have to know we exist. Most of God's people don't. But everybody must be born again. Wherever, whoever, whatever. You've got to have the Holy Ghost. And then Jesus described the new birth experience just so we would know for sure what it was. He said, now, the wind blows wherever it will. You don't have any control over that. And you hear its sound, but you don't know where it's coming from or where it's going. So it is with everyone who is born of the Spirit. You don't know anything about what God's up to, where He's going to move next, where He moved last week, five minutes ago. But when He moves on a person to give them the new birth, you hear something. So is everyone person born of the Spirit of God. Jesus knew when a person would be born again. And he knew he had to die to make that possible. He died, went up to heaven, offered himself to God for us, and asked God to give us his kind of life. And out of God's bosom came a big okay. And down on earth it sounded like a tornado coming. tongues as a fire and it sat on them. And every time it sat on somebody they started speaking in tongues. Born again. Paul said it too just in different words. 
Romans 8, you did not receive a spirit of slavery leading back into fear, fear of death or fear of anything else. But you received the spirit of adoption. Yes. Who adopted you? When you got the Holy Ghost, whose family did you get into? God's family. God adopted us. The spirit of adoption by which we name it and claim it. By which we repeat Romans 10, 9, and 10. Woo! The spirit by which we cry out. And the substance of that sound is Abba, that is Father. children of God. You must know that experience. You must be born again. That's what Jesus suffered and died for. My, my. And it is not optional. It's not just an added experience, an extra blessing given to some in God's family. It's the door into the family of God. It's the adoption. It's the new birth experience, the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And don't be distracted or, or dismayed or discouraged by the mistakes and failures of people who have received it. Righteous man falls seven times, it says, but he'll get back up. When my father, a free will Baptist minister, back in the mid-twenties, heard about the Holy Ghost from an old, ignorant man, couldn't read or write, but he had confidence in him because he knew he was an honest man. He always paid his bill at my father's, my father's stepfather's store. He knew he was an honest man, so he had to take him serious. And when the deacon there in the Baptist church found out he was interested in going to their meetings, he came to him in brotherly love to warn him. The people get in that mess, they live bad lives. Terrible. My father was curious. He said, well, you ever known anybody that ever lived right when they had that experience? He's, reluctantly, the old deacon said, well, yeah. Had a cousin who got in that mess one time, and he did seem like a, he's a pretty good fellow. And my father said, well, that's all I want to know. <laughs> if you live right with it, I want it. <laughs> Jesus said, he who loves, mm. Mm. I told you we could all go. <laughs> Okay. Put your crown back on your head. <laughs> oh, glory to God!
that they are drunk. Life will lose it. 